Good evening, everybody. My name is George Andreopoulos, and I'm the professor of political science here and director of the Center for International Human Rights. And on behalf of our center, I would like to welcome you all to tonight's event, a documentary on homophobia in Jamaica, the Gouillardes. This event <coughs> caps a series of events that we have held beginning last fall on LGBT rights issues that have included presentations by scholars and activists in the area, including our colleague Graham Reed from Human Rights Watch, who is also going to be one of the panelists tonight, today, after the discussion, after the documentary. They have included the showing of a very powerful play uh, uh, called, um, uh, uh, written by a activist playwright on the challenges confronting gay humanitarian workers returning from Africa. Um, then it has included a panel discussion on LGBT rights issues in celebration of the 64th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And has included also a presentation by our colleague here at John J. Dan Pinello on the challenges of same-sex couples living under superdomas in the United States. And of course, this event caps a series of activities that we decided to dedicate to the cause on LGBT rights. And this is what you might call our center's modest contribution to the global conversation on LGBT rights-related issues that is going on. Our efforts in launching this series of events this year have been underscored by two core beliefs. First of all, that LGBT people are entitled to all the rights that are guaranteed by international human rights law. From the most basic ones, like the right to life, to security, to privacy, to freedom from torture, to the right to freedom of expression, assembly and association, to right to education, health care, and so on and so forth. Second, that we do not believe that we need any new rights for LGBT people. And we do not believe that we need special rights for LGBT people. We believe that what we need is the application of the cross-cutting principle of non-discrimination in the enforcement of already recognized international human rights. And this actually has been the guiding spirit for this series of events that our center has organized. So we are very pleased to welcome you all this evening to this event. And uh, the structure of this evening will be as follows. After my own brief remarks will be followed, my own brief remarks will be followed by some welcoming remarks by Graham Reed, the director of the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Rights Program at Human Rights Watch. And then by some introductory remarks by our documentary filmmaker, Selena Blake, who will introduce Tabuliardis, which last, as I understand, what, about 75 minutes? 77, 77 minutes. I'm sorry there will be no popcorn and coke for the <laughs> performance. And then it will be followed by a discussion which will include Graham Reed and um, uh, Selena, of course, Maurice Tomlinson, and Steven Silva. And uh, we are going to discuss and share their experiences as activists in the area of LGBT rights. And they're trying to relate some of their experiences to some of the themes and issues that are raised in the documentary. Before I give the floor to Graham, I would like to express my thanks to a series of entities <coughs> and individuals that made this evening's event possible. First of all, of course, Selena Blake, the documentary filmmaker, who is the cause for being, uh, for us being here this evening. Then I would like to thank the um, uh, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Rights Program at Human Rights Watch, and its director, Graham Reed, for co-sponsoring this event. I would like to thank the Master Program in International Crime and Justice at John Jay College, as well as the Human Rights Studies Minor, 
and the PhD program in political science at the Graduate Center, who have all kindly offered their co-sponsorship for this event. And last but not least, our great staff at the Center for International Human Rights, who have worked diligently to make this series of events on LGBT rights issues a reality. I want to thank them for their dedication and hard work. And of course, for to all of you for being with us this evening. Without further ado, I would like now to give the floor to Graham Reed for his remarks. And once again, please make sure that you stay. First of all, welcome again. And please make sure that you stay with us throughout the evening. I can promise you that's going to be a long but exciting evening. Thank you. Professor Andreopoulos for both the invitation to be here this evening, but more importantly to be participating in a series of events um, during the course of the academic year. It's really been a privilege to be associated with you and your program. And um, this evening is particularly relevant for us at Human Rights Watch. Um, you've mentioned that I am the director of the LGBT program there, and many of you will be familiar with our work. But I think that three words sum up the approach that we have to, to the work that we do. And that is investigate, expose, and change. In 2004, we did a report on, on Jamaica. And those principles applied. We investigated the kinds of experiences focusing on, on gay men in Jamaica, the experiences of violence, the experiences of discrimination, the lack of access to health care. We use that to expose these abuses and to work for change. That organizations within Jamaica use the research report in order to do their lobbying and advocacy work. And we are very privileged to be associated and to work in close collaboration with organizations there. And I'm very pleased to have Maurice Tomlinson, who's been so centrally involved in our work in Jamaica over the last decade. And we've been approached by groups within Jamaica to say, listen, it's like 10 years since the last report came out. There are new advocacy opportunities in Jamaica at the moment. There's a, a sense of some change and possibility that's taking place that was not the case even a couple of years ago. And I'll leave Maurice, who's the expert on that, to talk more about that. But because we see that there's another advocacy opportunity, because we see there's opportunity for change within Jamaica, we've decided to do another research project there. And as we speak, there are two researchers in Kingston, Jamaica, embarking on that research. So it will be a follow-up looking at the findings of the 2004 report, which was called <coughs> Hated to Death, and look at what has changed and what has remained the same, and to feed into this climate of change, to contribute towards the change that we think is taking place both in Jamaica but potentially in the region. And increasingly the Caribbean seems out of step with certainly what's happening in Latin America and the kinds of statements that have been made by the Organization of American States. And so hopefully change in Jamaica would also generate some development in the region. And so that's our, our vision for, for change um, and for contributing to that kind of change with, within Jamaica. I'm going to just read one uh, pa paragraph from our 2004 report. It's the opening paragraph of the report. It's on June the 9th, 2004, Brian Williamson, Jamaica's leading gay rights activist, was murdered in his home, his body mutilated by multiple knife wounds. Within an hour after his body was discovered, a Human Rights Watch researcher witnessed a crowd gathered outside the crime scene. A smiling man called out, Batty man, homosexual, he get killed. Many others celebrated Williamson's murder, laughing and calling out, let's get them one at a time. That's what you get for sins. Let's kill all of them. Some sang, boom, bye, bye, a line from a popular Jamaican song about killing and burning gay men. Now, I read that it is a, it's, a, it's a very graphic illustration of the extreme levels of violence that many Jamaicans face. I also read it because it 
taps into what Professor Andreopoulos said about LGBT rights. And perhaps one of the unique things is that it is such a contested terrain as to whether LGBT people qualify for rights at all. So it's a contestation about the human. It's a contestation about who is entitled to human rights. Right? And I think that the film this evening speaks so graphically to that discussion and, and that debate. So thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. I look forward to the panel discussion after the film. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I didn't, Tabu Yardi started, you know, um, conversations with people. They're like, I can't go to Jamaica. And I'm like, why not? And, well, you know, we'll get beaten and all of that. And I'm like, I, I really didn't know it was going on because I started to work on a, another project. And I did some research and I found out that this was really happening. And I wanted to highlight, I wanted to show what was happening there with my people and maybe we can change things. Because I believe that the more you talk about things, you have room to learn more and to change. And so I'd like you to watch Tabu Yardis, and I look forward to speaking with you after watching the show. All right, thanks. Uh, now to our discussion. Uh, you have uh, already been introduced to all of the panels, but you've heard from two of them, Selena and Graham. I would like to introduce the other two panelists, Maurice Tomlinson, who is an attorney in law and has been involved in LGBT and HIV and AIDS activism in Jamaica and the Caribbean for over 18 years. By the way, the detailed biographical sketches are in a sheet of paper that we're all supposed to have received, so I'm not going to read all the information. And our uh, four speaker, Stephen Silva, who is the Asylum Paralegal at Immigration Equalities New York office. Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I have, um, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion with each of the panelists before we open to the floor. I, I'm asking them to um, relate to some of the themes that, and issues that were raised in the documentary and uh, bring in their own experiences from their work as activists in the LGBT area. But I would like to begin with a very basic question for, our, for Selena. You alluded at the beginning of your uh, comments that you were involved in another project uh, before, but then something happened and you decided to do the documentary on homophobia in Jamaica. What exactly was the reason that led you to do uh, uh, this documentary? My on research, after, after what I, I found out, how could I not? You know, it changed everything. And I, it wasn't a decision I made, it just happened. Mm -hmm. You know, and I wanted to bring this to light because, you know, when you talk about things, I, I believe that you have an opportunity to resolve issues. And, you know, talking is a form of resolving problems. And this opens up the dialogue, you know, Folks back home, as you know, we won't have this conversation. And if someone else brings it up, then we're reluctant to be a part of it. But the film gives an open door to say, let's have this discussion. Because as you indicated earlier, uh, I, I think it was Graham that indicated earlier that we should just have one rights. <clears throat> one set of rights for everyone. So that was how. OK. Uh, Graham, uh, as we were uh, coming into the uh, uh, room today, this evening for our session, uh, uh, we shared, um, we had a little bit of a discussion because we've both seen this documentary before about some of the, I raised with you the issue of Goldie's comments, which I thought was remarkable for a prime minister that saying if you agree to uh, giving rights uh, to gay and lesbian people, the next step is what are you going to do next? Uh, incest. And then after that, uh, uh, bestiality, I mean, it's good. quite a remarkable statement from a uh, head of government, yes. But uh, you told me, you alluded, and you also alluded in your comments here, that things may be changing in Jamaica, that there is a certain, uh, you are a little bit more optimistic about the situation now. Now, uh, Selena, her concluding remarks,
remarks at the documentary, uh, I think exhibits more of a, a pessimistic that not much has changed even with a new prime minister. So uh, given your work uh, in Jamaica, uh, can you tell us a little bit what is the source of the optimism and how can the uh, a human rights activist community there exploit the openings that might be provided in, the, in a change in Jamaica? Look, I think the documentary makes two important points. One is around the law and the levels of violence. The other is about public attitudes. Now, of course, public attitudes are slow to change, but I think that there are many people within the documentary who make the point of the link between the law and the link between the lack of a willingness among, of the leaders to take a, a position. Now, Portia Simpson-Miller is more receptive to a dialogue on this issue than her predecessor. That's one, one thing. The other thing that Maurice will tell us about is, is two precedent-setting court cases that are taking place. So that's another reason for optimism. The third reason is just in the broader region, how the organization of American states, how um, the... Uh, you know, just within the region that there's, a, that there's a move towards a more liberal, more tolerant um, approach, and there are legal changes taking place. So, you know, as I said previously, increasingly I think the Caribbean would find itself somewhat out of step in that respect. So I think for those three reasons, I would see there's some source for cautious optimism. Okay. Uh, Maurice, uh, and just following up on one of the comments that uh, Graham made, you are, among other things, you have a, a quite a remarkable career of activism in the region. You are the lead counsel in the first ever legal challenge uh, to Jamaican's anti-colonial, <coughs> uh, colonial anti-sodomy uh, law. Can you please tell us a little bit about this experience and what is the potential of law to be an instrument, effective instrument of change in this area? I'm going to take this question. I have a I have a two-day training session coming up in um, the Caribbean, and I don't want to exhaust my voice too soon. Um, yes, there is a lot of positives happening, as Graham has alluded to. Um, one of them being the initiation of a series of legal challenges. We have launched the first case before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights challenging the Jamaican anti-sodomy law. Um, we just heard in February that the government, had the f it was launched in 2011, and we heard in February that the government has been officially notified. So that's to give you an idea how quickly that system moves. Um, we've also launched a challenge to the television stations in Jamaica who have refused to air a tolerance ad which calls for the respect of the rights of LGBT, and the hearing of that case is May 27th to the 31st. We've also launched a case domestically challenging the anti-sodomy law. So we've launched a challenge to this law at the international level and at the domestic level. We're also challenging the immigration laws of Belize and Trinidad and Tobago, which ban the entry of homosexuals. Um, so Jamaica actually is is quite good. At least we don't ban the entry of homosexuals as Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago and Belize does. But, um, so, but the question is why would we pursue legal interventions as opposed to just you know, social interventions or cultural interventions? Um, it, there's a fall, it's a false choice to say that you have to have one or the other. The reality is you must have both. Um, our favorite quote of mine is once Mac, uh, Martin Luther King was asked, you know, why are you pursuing the civil rights law to be changed. You know, why do you want civil rights laws to protect gay, that, pr pr sorry, protect blacks? That won't cause the white man to love us. And his response was, yes, it won't cause him to love you, but it will stop him from lynching you. So for us, that's the first step. We want to put a stop to the license, licensed um, abuses. We know the police use the law to extort, to um, uh, you know, uh, bully to blackmail LGBT. We know that musicians use the law as justification for some of their homophobic songs. We know that parliamentarians use the law for calling for the closing down of LGBT organizations in Jamaica, etc., etc. So once we remove the law, we think it will open up a space 
for considering the full humanity of LGBT. Um, in addition, we are engaging in several <coughs> social interventions. We believe in a principle, eradicate hate, educate. So our focus, I am a lecturer, I was a lecturer at University of Technology Jamaica. Our focus is sharing our stories, sharing our narratives, having Jamaicans realize that we are their brothers and sisters and doctors and nurses and pastors and etc. We've done, you know, online social media campaigns. So while we're doing all of that, we're also going after the law. So it's not, in our view, one or the other. It's actually both. Uh, thank you. Um, Stephen, uh, you are um, working for a group that has managed to secure pro bono representation for many Jamaicans, um, LGBT and HIV positive that are seeking asylum in this country. Now, can you tell us a little bit about what are some of the challenges that these, your clients face as they are embarking on this long and tortuous process of asylum? And whether, from your experience, the immigration system here in the, this country might be becoming a little bit more sensitive to their claims. Sure. So um, it's, it's really great to be here, by the way. I see two major challenges to uh, pr providing a good pathway for LGBT and HIV positive Jamaicans to get asylum in the United States. First, you, you actually need to get out, right? You need to get out of Jamaica. That is massively challenging. Um, most of the Jamaicans that we see who actually make it to the United States and can access the systems by which they can apply for asylum, they come here on you know, work and travel visas or on tourist visas, but those visas aren't, aren't available to the most vulnerable Jamaicans who are living in very, very poor uh, neighborhoods. And, and so those people are trapped. They're basically trapped, and unless they can get help from someone or maybe get <coughs> I'm in through Mexico, which doesn't happen too often with Jamaicans. Um, those people are, are cut off. There's, there's another type of isolation, which is certainly cultural isolation. Um, if you grow up thinking that by being out, you will suffer from terrible consequences, if you grow up in fear, if you grow up with, with people saying terrible things to you and hurting you, then you may be reluctant to come out and try and approach an authority or try and approach a body that's willing to help you. Uh, it might take you time to, to integrate into a, a loving LGBT community in the United States. Um, and uh, you know, as, as soon as you, you step your foot onto American soil, the clock is ticking for you to apply for asylum. You know, you're supposed to do it within a year of coming here. And if in that first year of being here, you don't have the fortune to find someone to help you apply for uh, asylum, then you might be shit out of luck. Uh, so there, there are massive barriers in place um, to LGBT people finding those services. You know, service providers try to make partnerships with with local community members. What we try to do is, you know, every, every year we make sure that there is there are articles and major newspapers about asylum. Um, we have had gay Jamaicans, gay Russians, you know, go on the record talking about their experiences finding assistance, and we, we really hope that those voices and those stories get back to communities in other countries where, where people start to have this seed planted in their mind where, you know, if, if somehow I can just get out of Jamaica, out of Russia, out of um, any country where it's dangerous to be LGBT or HIV positive, then, you know, I can, I can come forth out of the shadows and I can get the help that I need and, and just be safe and live my life. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll open now the floor to discussion. Uh, I have one request, please. Ask questions, don't make statements. Okay. Uh, you can make statements to the speakers when we have the reception afterwards. So, uh, and brief questions so that we can get the opportunity to as many people as possible to ask questions. And please, when you take your microphone, also identify yourself. We are recording the event and we want to have uh, uh, to identify all the people participate in this discussion. Yes. 